Well, I will talk a little bit about health effects and biological effects of artificial electromagnetic fields. And you are probably all greater experts than I am. Yesterday I was up in Marienlyst outside of Helsingør and at a tremendously well-organized meeting with very interesting uh, lectures. And in the evening I had the great honor to meet Fleming who is sitting up here and we had a fantastic discussion, and I hope we will continue to have that in the future as well. I have a friend in Ireland, uh, Professor Tom Butler, and uh, he has said the following, uh, children, and I have myself added, and adults are at growing risk of present and future ill health from wireless technology due to weak governments, captured government departments and agencies, corrupt institutions, a compliant press and unethical or ignorant academics. Why the Danish flag? Well, since uh, Denmark is very famous as a democracy, I hope you don't have these kind of problems. I hope your society works much better than in Ireland. Uh, in Sweden, the society doesn't work very well at all, I'm afraid to say. Uh, the government and parliament and health authorities and radiation protection authorities and so on has a lot to uh, do in the near future regarding these questions. Historically, and as I said, you are all experts on this, you know about uh, that Nikolai Tesla, for instance, he might have been one of the very first persons that contracted what we would called today electrohypersensitivity. Uh, as you know, he's uh, the man behind a lot of inventions uh, that we nowadays take for granted in our everyday working life as well as private life. Uh, and uh, the most famous electrohypersensitive person today is, of course, Gro Harlem Brundtland, the former uh, prime minister of Norway, a medical doctor and former head of the World Health organization in Geneva, and she has come forward and talked about her electrohypersensitivity in a very composed and uh, intelligent way. And already when the electricity was introduced, uh, certain persons actually started to claim adverse health effects, and when you read these anecdotal evidence, you feel that it might have been the first cases like Nikolai Tesla. Uh, who had electrohypersensitivity. And you cannot jump Nancy Wertheimer and Ed Leeper, uh, who studied uh, the distribution in Denver, United States, of uh, cases of childhood leukemia, and noted that they were not evenly distributed, which they should be in such a big city as Denver. Uh, they were instead clumped together in what's called clusters, at certain addresses, and to make a long story short, they found out that at these addresses, uh, the kids had lived in homes near high current power lines where the electromagnetic fields were stronger. And they wrote a number of articles, including a very famous article in the journal Science, uh, where they described their findings. And that led to that the World Health Organization in 2001, slash 2002 classified power frequency magnetic fields as possibly carcinogenic. And uh, that was the first time such exposures had been identified due to the findings of uh, Wertheimer and Lieper, as well as later on replicated by other scientists around the world. 2011, 10 years after, uh, the same World Health Organization classified also radio frequency electromagnetic fields as possibly carcinogenic. And within that category, you would find all the types of microwaves that you use for wireless telecommunication. And there are different versions of it, uh, which you can call 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G, 7G, and so on. Uh, and uh, they differ in between technically but from a health and biological point of view, maybe they are more common than different. 2011, uh, the Council of Europe, and Denmark is a member of 
the Council of Europe, as is Sweden as well, uh, said that we should ban mobile phones and wireless networks in schools. And the Council of Europe concluded that immediate action was required to protect children. Do you remember what happened in, here in Denmark when the Council of Europe said this? Well, nothing happened. Uh, your government, parliament, health authorities on, they didn't give a toss about Danish children. What happened in Sweden? Nothing. And that's very odd, you know. The Council of Europe is a very major player in world politics. Uh, it's kind of equal to the United Nations and similar organizations. So generally, people would listen to the Council of Europe. But for some reason, here they didn't. And that's very strange because the WHO had already cancer classified both power frequency magnetic fields, which is a long name for household electricity, as well as radio frequency fields. Uh, and that means that parents, teachers, and so on, they actually put children in rooms that are filled with an exposure that is equal from a formal point of view as rooms filled with lead petrol exhausts, marine diesel fuel, HIV type 2, which gives uh, rise to uh, AIDS, dry cleaning chemicals, chloroform, carbazol, which you find in tobacco smoke, and a long list of things. And when I ask parents, including parents that work in the telecom sector, if they are prepared to put their kids in a 2B exposure from, for instance, petrol exhausts, they tell me, are you crazy? Of course not. We would never subject our kids to that danger. But you are. It's just another exposure in the form of wireless internet, cell phones, and power distribution and so on. And parents in Sweden at least, when I tell them this, they get angry, not at me, but at their authorities, the government, the parliament, uh, who hasn't told them. Some get actually very angry. Danish and Swedish parents, they love their children. And in Sweden we put reflective vests on our children, colorful overalls, bicycle helmets, and when they visit the work site, they get an even better helmet. But from the effect of these, the children are completely naked. And that's enigmatic in a country like Sweden, where we are so very protective. And I've noticed that you don't even shake hands here. You're afraid of something. And you wash yourself all the time uh, with alcohol instead of drinking it. <laughs> Strange. Uh, you don't need to be so afraid, actually. This is about 5G. And at the same time, it's not. Because scientifically, we don't know very much at all about the health and biological effects. Because, as you soon will see, there is practically no research yet. Uh, and therefore, I will concentrate on the previous versions, like 432 and so on, Gs, and other exposures that you actually sit in right now. I will start with a meeting in the Senate um, February the 7th, 2019, it's about one year ago, at a hearing, the U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal, he asked different authorities, like the Federal Communication Commission and the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, and the operators regarding what kind of research they had so they knew that the 5G rollout would be completely safe. And it took some time, but when they came back, uh, he said, um, or sorry, the, uh, he got the answer that the wireless carriers concede they are not aware of any independent scientific studies on safety of 5G. And therefore, citizens, like in the United States or in Denmark, must come up with a precautionary principle of their own making. 
And therefore, you are meeting here today because you want to protest and maybe change uh, the rollout of this particular version. There are reasons why this could be discussed and maybe even banned and halted. And one such reason is that 5D, as were the previous versions, don't forget that, uh, it was the same for everyone, is rolled out without any form of pre-marketing testing or strategic health and environmental assessments, thus flaunting the precautionary principle of the European Union law. And since there hasn't been a Dexit yet, you are still members of the European Union. And you have to adhere to this. But oddly enough, again, uh, for some things, the laws, the regulations are just forgotten. 5D is ruled out without any public consultation or informed public consent, as is normally the golden standard. And thus seriously violating, for instance, the Human Rights Act from the United Nations, the 2007 UN Convention on the Human Rights for Persons with Functional Impairments, and also the Nuremberg Code from 1947. I remember I wrote a debate column, a commentary, many years ago, and I think it was about 3D, and I pointed to already then that these uh, laws and regulations were jeopardized by the decisions going straight above the head of the citizens. You are never invited to take part in these decisions. You are just supposed to buy and use all the gadgets. 5D is also rolled out without any biologically based exposure standards. Uh, the standards that are used are only technical. Uh, and nothing uh, is um, uh, reflected upon biological or medical uh, consequences. However, 5D is rolled out with a massive independent scientific research showing that already existing man-made electromagnetic radiation from 4, 3, 2G and many other similar sources is harmful to public health and ecology. I mean, we can have truckloads of scientific papers uh, clearly demonstrating this. But again, no one seems to care, except for you then. It's also rolled out with a known price tag in the form of a huge ecological footprint. This footprint will envelope this planet in an electrosmog blanket from which there is no escape. In this prison, surveillance and control will be everywhere and every time, allowing for an electronic 1984 of unimagined proportions, pushing George Orwell's Big Brother is watching you into a chilling reality far from a democratic system. Wherever I go in the world, and you know I travel more or less every week of the year somewhere on this planet, I always ask people, and I ask you too, is this what you actually want? <clears throat> As you know, it's already a fact in countries like China. And when I listened yesterday on the Swedish television news, I heard that they are now starting to use face recognition systems in Sweden too. Good or not? 1984 or 2020? Non-democratic or democratic? Where should we draw the line? I know where I stand on this, but you need to think about it, I would say. So, what can we now learn from science? And since the time is short, uh, I will have to be a little bit short. A number of scientists have shown that when you use a cell phone, uh, you would contract a headache. Um, when I ask, again, audiences around the world, including audiences consisting of telecom uh, employees and uh, heads and so on, no one says that, oh yeah, I want to have a headache from my cell phone. So actually we could stop here. 
and walk out and go across the street to some authority and say, hey, you need to take this away. I will not allow myself and my family to contract a headache due to this usage. But at least in Sweden, people nowadays report that it's normal at the end of a workday to have a headache. It's not normal. That's a sign that something is wrong. Either that your work is too stressful or that you're exposed to chemicals and physical exposures that will make the brain signal, hey, take me out of here. You get an avoidance behavior. Other scientists have shown that if you expose pregnant women to cell phone signals uh, or usage, that significantly would increase fetal and neonatal heart rate and significantly decrease the cardiac output. In layman terms, the babies get stressed. When I ask parents and grandparents if they want their fetuses and newly borns to be stressed by the cell phone, no one pops up and say, oh, that's good. That's exactly what I want. No, they again get angry, not at me, but at authorities that evidently turn a blind eye on these findings. So again, we could just stop here because in most families, the most precious thing they ever get is a baby or several babies. So they want to protect them. As you know, a number of scientists have shown that cell phone use decreased the semen quality in men by decreasing the sperm count, motility, viability, and normal morphology. You know, I'm a very simple person, a simple scientist. And I work in the tradition of observing in the reality and going back to the laboratory and continue the observations into controlled experiments. And as you know, when you observe the European male population, are their sperm cells in their quality going like this? Or are they like this? Or are they whoo, like that? Yeah, there is a dramatic reduction. In many countries, the authorities are actually extremely concerned that the sperm cell quality is decreasing so rapidly. If I was the prime minister of Sweden or Denmark, even nicer, uh, it wouldn't be so hard to think, hmm, do we actually know what we are doing right now? No, we don't, of course. Me as a prime minister, maybe I should read this, contemplate it, and start asking questions. And in the meantime, maybe have a moratorium, a complete ban, a stop, and say, we must know if this is dangerous to sperm cells. Because, again, if a few Danes would get the brain tumor, Denmark will survive. But if all the Danes cannot get babies any longer, then there isn't any more Denmark. Other scientists uh, have shown that when you expose mice, um, you may have a transgenerational effect, meaning that down the line, and if we interpret it into your reality, your grand-grand, grand-grand, grandchildren may not be able to get any more children in the future. Has any one of you met your grand, 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 grandchildren? No, it's impossible because you will be dead when they are born, you know. Uh, so it's too late to call back and say, hey, please, could you stop doing that? Because we have an effect 100, 150 years down the line which is not good at all. Please stop this exposure. And the irreversible infertility may be a very costly 
realization of the use of cell phone technology. Henry Lai is probably the foremost expert in this area, and he has done a lot of studies, including this one from 1994, where he exposed rats in a problem-solving situation, and the exposure was just for one 45-minute lecture. It was with a Bluetooth uh, frequency, 2.45 gigahertz, and at the exposure level, called SAR, or specific absorption rate, which was well below the two watts per kilogram that Danes are supposed to withstand. So it was a safe exposure, no uh, hazards whatsoever. But it turned out that these rats showed a retarded learning in the form of a um, decreased concentration capacity and a decreased short-term memory. Well, someone might say, in Denmark, we kill rats. We don't want them to be indoors or outdoors. But the question is, do you also kill boys? Because when this was repeated using boys in a linguistic test, when they were exposed to cell phone radiation, they did less well. In layman terms, you can say that the boys were dumbed down. Is that what you want? Probably not, I would say. Uh, so here is food for a lot of thought. The very famous reflex study, which investigated the damaging effect on DNA, uh, the um, molecule behind our um, uh, genes, uh, showed that one day or 24 hour of mobile phone exposure again below the two watts per kilogram that you are supposed to withstand, produced a fragmentalization of the DNA, which looked very much the same as the one you would see after a theoretical 1,600 chest X-rays. There are no patients on this planet who has ever received 1,600 chest X-rays. So it's really a hypothetical exposure. But the same happens after 24 hours of mobile phone exposure. And we have to realize that maybe this is one of the causative factors for, for instance, damage of sperm cell quality, fertility issues, as well as it could be the basis for cancer um, uh, increase. When the study was finished, do you believe me when I say that the industry, the telecom industry, went to a bizarre length trying to stop the publication of this study? But after two years, they had to give up, and it was published, and you can read about it on the internet if you're interested. Plants, like tomato plants, they are also at jeopardy. This very famous French study show that exposure at sort of low levels from base station type exposures uh, produced um, a damaging effect similar to, and I quote, it was as if we had crushed the tomato plants with a hammer. The cells of this tomato plant reacted with a damaged sequence involving a molecule called calmodulin. The same as if I would crush you with a hammer. We have the same molecules. But the scientists had not even touched the tomato plants. It was just an effect of the exposure. One study that really keeps me awake nowadays, and since the year 2017, is this. And there are other similar studies that are similar to this, Tahiri et al. Uh, what they did was that they exposed common bacteria, bacteria that you have on your body right now and in your body, regardless of if you wash yourself with the alcohol or not. Uh, and uh, they exposed it to GSM, 2G uh, exposures, and to 2.4 gigahertz radio frequency radiated from a Wi-Fi router. Not very much happened. 
apart from one thing. The bacteria became antibiotic resistant. The very same year, 2017, independently of Tahiri and his co-workers, the G20 countries had a special meeting in Europe about the fact that around 33,000 Europeans are put to an too early death because of antibiotic resistance in healthcare. And it was said at the D20 meeting that by the year 2050, it is calculated that more than 10 million people around the planet will die too early because of the same antibiotic resistance in healthcare. If you mix the G20 country meeting and with Tahiri's results, then you can speculate that maybe the year 2050 will see instead 7.6 billion people dying prematurely. So this keeps me awake, I could tell you. There are also cognitive impacts, and the time is too short, but it should not be forgotten. As you know, kids today, uh, they will have too many hours in front of a screen, less time for social contacts and physical activities, with risk for neck and back aches, overweight, sleep problems, severe myopia, near-sightedness, and IT addiction. For instance, in Sweden, the authority called Transportstyrelsen, which gives out driving licenses, has recently said that very many kids in Sweden will not be allowed to try for a driving license because they are too myopic. They can only focus on things very close to them, and such drivers we cannot have out in traffic. With autonomous cars, maybe it doesn't matter but it's a dramatic shift in the ordinary biology of kids. And the question is again, do you really want that? Yes or no? Also, it should not be forgotten that the OECD has said that frequent use of computers in school is more likely to be associated with lower results. So the computerization of schools have worked in the opposite way than it was thought to be. And maybe this is the explanation why children and teenagers in countries like China are nowadays not allowed to use such gadgets uh, at all or very little. Maybe the authorities there take these questions more seriously. And as you know, China has a very simple business model uh, they want to buy it all. They want to buy Denmark too. Uh, don't forget that, you know. Uh, Sweden, Finland, everything. Uh, and by doing it, they need a population that is super smart, super sharp, uh, and not nearsighted and dumbed down. So maybe that's the reaction to it in China. Well, in Denmark, you should be a, um, withstanding a SAR value of two watts per kilogram. And there are authorities called ICNIP and also the World Health Organization who has decided this. The bad thing is though that when you look in the scientific literature, very, very, very many scientists, I could have slide after slide after slide after slide, show dramatic effects for instance, on eating and drinking, calcium effluxes, DNA damaging effects, EEG alterations, um, leakage of the blood-brain barrier, changes in cell cycle and cell proliferation, which are arrived at at low or very low, extremely low exposures, far below the two watts per kilogram. So the recommendations, they don't take into account any such effects. And every day, more or less, there is a new paper added showing that the guidelines do not protect anything in society, actually. So, about safety, acute or chronic exposure, very, very well below current official guidelines to wireless radiation is harmful. The need of biologically-based exposure standards is instant. 
not only for 5G, but for 4, 3, and 2G, and so on. Immediate protective action is called for especially for the younger generations, fetuses, newly borns, toddlers, children, teenagers, young women and men. And it's really up to you and to me and to others to stand up and say, no, now we need a change. Always remember that the current Danish guideline recommendation given as power density in microwatts per square meter and at 1800 megahertz frequency is 9 million microwatts per square meter. But the natural background is this number. And many of you here are, like me, a little bit older. So when we were born, we were born into this. This background uh, was our natural background at the time. And then people have put on wireless internet, 1G, 2G, and so on, and allowing for this exposure. And already in 1997, I said that the only way to know that we have a safe exposure is to use the natural background level as the maximum allowed exposure. And uh, I did that at the trade union meeting in Stockholm. And at it, uh, there was an uh, opponent, a very fierce disbeliever of uh, myself and my actions. And he stood up and said the following, I never trust what Ole Johansson says, but this time he is dead right. And that was very flattering, but also a little bit shocking to me. I hadn't expected that, but as he said, this is the only way we could know that the exposure is safe. And therefore I said we should use it as a genuine hygienic safe limit. And if you do, then you will protect these and the, how should we say, the product of their love, uh, and these, and these, and so on. But if you use this, then you saw in all the previous papers that then you definitely risk the population, the plants, the bacteria, the fungi, the other animals. And it's up to you to decide what you want to do. So finally, what are we doing about it and what are others up to? Well, to begin with, one could remember just to get some arguments when you meet people and you talk to them. Uh, by the way, <laughs> uh, when I, you know, no one knows who I am. Uh, I came a little bit early and, um, sorry, uh, I came a little bit early and I took a cup of coffee uh, just around the corner and um, then there was a family, a mother and father, and a very small baby and a two-year-old. And the mother and father, they were checking their smartphones. So I leant forward and said, you know, I read that the radiation from such cell phones could cause cancer. Have you heard about that? And the parents went, what? No, what? Well, since you have a smartphone, I said, why don't you Google it? And I will help you. Google the WHO, radio frequency, cancer 2011. And they started to do it. And after like four or five minutes, they came over to my table because I'd moved to my coffee, coffee, coffee cup. And uh, then the mother said, yeah, <laughs> it's correct what you say. It's all here in black and white. Have your authorities told you about this? Your government, your parliament? Maybe, she said, but I've never heard about it. So I'm seeding, as you say in English. I'm putting a seed into the soil, into the mental soil. And you can do the same by borrowing arguments like from the current vast, and in just one German database, it's more than 28 thousand relevant papers, some showing effects, some not showing effects. Um, 
it is obvious we must proceed with caution before immersing the citizens in more and more artificial electromagnetic fields. And you already understand that, and therefore you have this meeting today. We may, as a matter of fact, already be gravely endangering our current as well as coming generations. And especially if there are transgenerational effects, uh, then, as we said before, uh, your grand-grand, uh, grand-grand, grandchildren will not only love you, they will curse you like hell. So think more than once about the effect of the artificial electromagnetic fields. To not act today may prove a disaster tomorrow, and such lack of action may again result in the classical late lessons from early warnings or as I have rephrased it myself, too late lessons from early warnings. Every evening I go down on my knees and I ask God, please make me wrong and make all the other scientists equally wrong. Make all of it safe. Uh, but that would mean that a lot of scientific peer review based publications all have to be wrong at the same time. And that has never happened before, not in that kind of a number. So when I go to bed, I feel that God is probably not listening to me. I have met a lot of Danes. I never understand what you say, but some things I understand. And I have understood when I walked around in Helsingør, for instance, that um, Danes, they look upon Swedes as being dull, boring, and very whining and repetitive. <laughs> and also depressed. Yeah, so that's the view. And they are right. I, I shook their hands and said, you are right. We are a bloody boring and depressive and repetitive kind of people. And therefore, when I, in 1983, coined this, this is the largest full-scale experiment ever. What happens when we, 24 hours around the clock, wherever we are, allow ourselves and our children to be used as guinea pigs, whole body irradiated, at colossal exposure levels for the rest of our lives? 1983, no one responded. So I thought, hmm, well, let's repeat, 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 repeat. Continue, whine, whine, complain, 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 ask, ask, ask. And now we are at 2020. You know, yesterday evening, I really felt tired because no one seems to listen and no one seems to be prepared to come up with an answer to this question. Um, and that stresses me, actually. Uh, I don't know where to turn. Uh, the only thing I could say that 1994, when the tabloid in Sweden, Expressen, had this illustration uh, and said that this is the Christmas gift uh, of the year, perhaps, uh, the illustration may have been the worst they could ever pick. Maybe they should instead have had a distance between this cell phone and the baby and a very, very, very long distance in between. But at that time, people were blinded by the new technology and everyone just wanted to have it and more and more and more. And that's again a problem for you because nearly every Dane I have met out there as consumers, they say that, no, I want to have 5G. I want to have more, better, faster, bigger, quicker. Uh, that's something you need to work against. Uh, and I'm sure you will find the means to do it. I said that no one is listening, but actually, uh, it turned out that a few persons listened. One of them would be the municipality of Benevento, which is outside of Naples in Italy. And by 2006, they invited 30 experts, or should we say 29 experts and me. And we came there, and 
I suggested we should write the resolution and publish it after the conference. And so we did. And we pointed to that the precautionary principle must be in play. We should inform the population of the potential risks. And we should limit cell phone and cordless phone use by young children and teenagers. And as you note here, tw 2006, the wireless internet, Wi-Fi, was not on the chart. So we didn't include that, but uh, uh, three years later on in the London resolution, we did. Uh, but we pointed to that we need to inform, we need to limit, we need to use the precautionary principle. And uh, we should really honor the municipality of Benevento because they felt it was so very, very important to discuss this. Others have also listened very carefully to me. And they have introduced bans in schools for um, uh, cell phones, like in France, Nigeria, Solomon Islands, Uganda, Malaysia, Japan, Belgium, Indonesia, Maryland, United States, and Cyprus. But where is Denmark and Sweden in this? You know, I'm very prejudiced. Uh, so I don't like to be overrun by countries like Uganda, Solomon Islands, and Nigeria. I thought Sweden and Denmark were better when it comes to protecting children than they are. But we are not. We are not. And remember, for instance, that Uganda is the first country in the world banning all types of plastic bags. We haven't done that yet. We should reduce the usage a little bit and so on. I mean, they are far ahead of us. And that's also stressful uh, because they have listened to me and to others, and they have reacted and acted upon it. So, in summary, do not believe that mobile phones, iPads, and Wi-Fi are safe. They are not. Even a blind person can see that, you know. That's very obvious. And as you soon will see, the major players in our society has known this for more than 20 years. And they have acted upon what I have told them. These gadgets and their electromagnetic fields interfere with normal brain function, learning, memory, fertility, cancer risks, and have been shown to shatter the DNA in cells. All of this can be found in peer-reviewed scientific journals, but until now has not been in the public domain. One very important thing you can do, and I see you are like 50 people in here or something, after this meeting, do as I do. Go out and start seeding. Lean towards people and say, hmm, I've heard that this could cause cancer or problems with fertility. Uh, the latter thing is exploding in Sweden. More and more young couples need to have different forms of artificial impregnation methods, like test tube babies. It wasn't like that before. Uh, so something has changed, and I'm not ruling out chemical exposures, stress, and so on. There could add to it as well, of course, and maybe the physical exposures are the smallest part of it, or the biggest. But I think we need to react and act upon it. What about the major players? I said, you know, that for many years when I went around and I was whining and saying, you know, what happens when we expose ourselves and our kids and blah, 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 blah. And I saw blank faces, blank reactions, nothing. But they were not entirely blank. Uh, it turned out that there were people there. And I remember one time I gave a lecture in a small Swedish town like this, you know. And um, then I saw in the audience a person, a man, and I thought, strange. Wasn't he in the audience two weeks before, but 500 kilometers north of this small town? No, no, I'm imagining this. And then three weeks later on, I went to Karlstad, close to Norway, 
And I came into the lecture hall and immediately I saw the same man in the audience. And I asked the organizers, who is that? Well, it's Mr. C and so, and he is from Telia, uh, the big um, uh, operator. Wow, that was interesting. And um, evidently he was really very interested to listen and to learn. And he is among the big players because the World Health Organization, the Radiation Protection Authorities, the telecom operators, the telecom manufacturers, and the insurance as well as the reinsurance companies have all of them listened carefully and for years ago completely abandoned the safe ship. Uh, they just don't touch this with a pair of pliers even. And I remember a conference I was um, at in London 2002 and representatives of uh, Lloyd's UK, which is the largest insurance company, uh, Swiss Rea, which is the largest reinsurance company, if Scandia, which is a smaller company from Sweden, and so forth. They were all there, and uh, they all summarized and said, for them, it was not, and I repeat, 2002, it's nearly 20 years ago, for them, it was not the question whether the radiation posed a danger or not. They knew it was dangerous. For them, the only question was, who is going to pay for the party in the future? And they will not do it. And therefore, on their exceptions, their blacklist, they have health effects, of electromagnetic fields, all categories, all types, all modulations, all versions, all um, polarizations, all pulsations, everything is on it. So the naked babies we talked about before, the children without any protection, they are not even with the legal protection from the insurance and reinsurance companies or from the manufacturers or the operators, and so on. And for me, that's more telling than any boring, whining Swede. This tells you a lot more, that there are layers of society who decides differently. And you live in one layer, and you are supposed to buy, use, and love your gadgets, but they will not take any form of legal responsibility for it. They sell it as safe, but they don't want to touch it later on. So maybe the only correct answer to my question is no more full-scale experimentation until they climb aboard again to cover any form of future legal liability claims. Another answer could be when will we see a moratorium based on the precautionary principle for the sake of humans, animals, plants, and bacteria? When will we all start reacting to all the evidence on our tables? Thank you.